Hello, my name is Leslie Rush. I'm a professor at uh, Université Laval in Quebec City, Canada, and I'll be talking to you today about equity, diversity, and inclusion, particularly in photonics education. And I want to set out right from the beginning that this is a uh, very personal take on this issue, which uh, for me ha holds a great personal importance and why I welcome the opportunity to talk to you about it today. So the outline of my talk today is I will start out by introducing you uh, to myself and giving you a little background on my own uh, experiences. And as part of that, I'd like to share with you four lemmas I've come up with as a woman engineer um, that uh, um, I think uh, might be of interest. Once I've gone through my uh, own personal experiences, I'll go into a brief discussion of why STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math as a field is very important in the uh, adoption of good EDI practices, EDI being equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'll take each one of those terms, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and talk about it a little bit, and uh, finally some concluding remarks. So for my biography, I'll start out with a pictorial biography, and we'll start out with my bachelor's degree. So I received my bachelor's degree uh, from Caltech, and uh, I'll start with some of my experience I had at that point. So when I joined Caltech, uh, women undergraduates were only admitted in the fall of 1970, with four of them receiving bachelor's degree in 73. So when I joined them in 77, uh, women on campus were still something of a novelty. Um, I graduated in uh, 1980, and uh, while I was there, I uh, got to uh, live through a little bit of uh, the difficulty, the adaptation of women on campus becoming co-ed. Uh, there were, when I was there, perhaps 10% women on campus. I'm sure it's, it's much, much higher today. But uh, at that point, um, they were still adapting to women students. It's still pretty recent. And one of the uh, controversies that arrived uh, while I was there was with the student newspaper the California Tech, which every year uh, would have a centerfold. And not too surprising, as women became more of a force on the campus, they pushed back and said, you know, this is really not appropriate for a newspaper that represents uh, all of the undergraduate student body. And uh, so that was what they called the hot throbbing uh, controversy. So, um, it was a little give and take with the uh, editorial staff. There was no newspaper for 79.80, but uh, finally there were no more centerfolds. And, and I don't want you to give the wrong impression. In fact, I think that uh, from my experience on campus, the student body was uh, really uh, encouraging to having uh, women uh, on campus. They were, were very happy to have that. And so, uh, this uh, was resolved. And I'd like to take you, as I was leaving Caltech and entering my professional life, what I discovered to be the first lemma of a woman engineer, and that is, it's not all controversy, it's not all difficult. In fact, there's some good side to being uh, a somewhat underrepresented group in engineering, a woman engineer, and that is that a woman engineer always gets respect from her neighbor on the airplane. I can tell you, I still, Love that feeling when they turn to you, oh, and what do you do? Oh, I'm an electrical engineer. Oh, wow, that's great. So, uh, some good play. Of course, we haven't been on too many airplanes lately, but eventually we'll be back in the air and uh, enjoy that little perk. So, uh, as, after I um, finished my bachelor's degree, I went to work right away. I worked uh, in the government. Uh, and in fact, I was a project management engineer working on telecommunications projects. Some, uh, mostly wireless, but some optical as well. And in fact, I'd just like to share with you a little bit of the hiring experience that I had. So I was the first woman ever, engineer ever hired into the group where I worked. And the interview took, well, I'll call some unusual turns. You know, every interview is about how will this person fit into my team? Because we all, nobody works in isolation. Everybody works uh, pulling together. And, you know, when we uh, address... Um, issues of diversity, this can be a concern. How is this person going to fit in? And so during the interview, I, you know, it was going well, everything was fine, but I just felt that there was this like uh, hesitation, let me say, in the room. And the 
conversation turned and i happened to mention that i owned a sixty seven dodge dart throughout all of my undergraduate career as an old beat up car and i didn't have much money and so i did all of the repairs on the car myself to the extent i could for instance i changed the clutch on this car and i also had some serious engine problems and i removed the engine head myself to save money before i turned it over to the experts to work on it when i told the story of this work on my car it was amazing how the atmosphere in the room changed suddenly everyone was relaxed and i could almost see going on the back of my oh yeah she'll fit in it's okay you know so i don't know what the moral of this story is i just found it interesting and uh, i don't want to give the impression that the person who comes into a group who is the diverse one has to make everyone else at ease of course that, that that's not the case um but maybe maybe that's something that we think we have to do and uh, certainly, um, as I joined that group and integrated into it and had a very successful uh, time with it, a very enjoyable time working with that group, I came to my second lemma of the woman engineer. And my second lemma is that you don't have to learn to drink beer, okay? Group I earned, they, they loved going out uh, in the evening to have uh, a few rounds, and I thought I had to, but then suddenly, with time, I realized, no, it wasn't really a prerequisite, that that wasn't what it was all about, um, adapting uh, to a diverse environment. So I guess uh, after my years in government, I thought I'd like to get a little tech here. So I actually returned to do my graduate school after um, my hiatus in uh, government. And I returned to do my, uh, bachelor, uh, my master's and PhD at Princeton University. So. That's when I came across my third lemma for the woman engineer, and I have uh, one of my uh, male colleagues with me uh, who was responsible for me coming to this uh, third lemma, because we were discussing, and I said, oh yeah, I'm worried about this class I'm taking. I didn't do very well, you know, it'll look bad if a woman, you know, doesn't do well in a class. And he turned to me and looked at me, Leslie, you know, you don't actually represent half of the, of the population of the earth. And uh, I think, you know, it's like, wow, you know, he's right. I don't actually uh, have to worry about that. I just worry about myself getting through, doing the best I can. And uh, I, I think that's an important lesson uh, to learn. So uh, another point I'd like to make is that there are many different career paths that we may come across and to not uh, be too quick to judge people who come along different paths. For instance, I had no master plan. Uh, when I returned to graduate school. I started thinking I'd get a master's degree, but looked around, everybody else is doing a PhD. It looks like it's interesting, fun, stimulating. So I ended up staying for a PhD. I also thought when I left graduate school that I would go back to government, maybe industry, but I looked around me and everyone else was applying to academia, and I thought, oh, what the heck, maybe I'll give that a try. So no master plan, sort of stumbled into what I wanted. Some people know exactly what they want and, and work towards it immediately. Perfectly valid. Uh, career paths uh, either way. I'm a big science fiction fan. One of my favorite uh, recent uh, novels has been the trilogy uh, called The Three, Bro the Three Body Problem. I especially like that title because it reminds me of the problem I faced, which was the two body problem. And the two body problem, as you all know, is that um, a, a couple uh, would like to live together <laughs> And they would like to live in the same city and they would like to work in the same city. And that is often a difficulty. So when I was graduating uh, from uh, um, graduate school, I had to look for employment and I had to find a place where my uh, husband and I could both uh, have employment. And it ended up uh, bringing me to a Canadian university. I actually am from Chicago originally, uh, but uh, now uh, I uh, work at Laval University, uh, and I'll share some of my experiences with you uh, there. So, as I mentioned, 25 years now in academia uh, at uh, Laval University, and one thing that I would really like to uh, share with you is how uh, very pleased I have been with my experience at Laval, and one of the reasons is that work-life balance is not a dirty word. Of course, it's a couple of words, but anyway, the concept, an under concept. I was uh, very impressed with the 
uh, administration and particularly in the department and my colleagues, the professors uh, that I work with most closely, um, were uh, all very much keen into finding a good balance between uh, private life and work life. So you can see how what a big impact one's environment uh, can have. So this uh, ends a little bit of my uh, biographical part. And now I'd like to talk about, uh, I said I was looking at EDI in photonics education. And education, so I'm going to focus on, you know, as a professor, uh, what impact we have on education and especially on these uh, EDI um, topics. So first of all, you know, not everyone perhaps who's listening to this is a professor. And there are some um, parts of our life, some of it is quite obvious, but some is a little different. And uh, first thing, you have to be very resourceful uh, as a professor because you really don't have a big uh, support network. So universities are big, there are offices that help, but for the most part, a, a university professor is, is, is responsible for finding their own students, for finding funding, for, for looking for collaborators. So you have to be a great communicator, and certainly that's true evidently in the classroom and at conferences. But it's also important to be an excellent communicator with your graduate students, which may be a very diverse group. And uh, certainly writing grant proposals, I should have put that up there with the, the traditional ones. But uh, communications is important. Uh, and also, like I said, there's, there's not a big support network, so you are kind of like a mom and pop operation. Do your own marketing, your own financing, administration, human resources. And because of that, uh, EDI is your concern. I mean, it's very much something that should be in the mind of professors uh, because, uh, as I'd like to, to share with you, I think it has a, a big impact. So we are in Clio here, and so clearly science, technology, engineering, and math, or the STEM, uh, maybe I don't have to make the case to you on how important this field is. It's important for our economic well-being. We're, we're drivers in, in uh, economic development. And ultimately, this economic development, we also, as uh, STEM uh, researchers and contributors, uh, contribute to the improvement of the quality of life for all people, we hope. Uh, and so uh, this uh, is a very, very important field. It's, it's great. It's important because of the skills we learn. We learn to ask good questions, collect information. We organize our ideas. We test them. We're problem solvers. We apply what we have learned. And ultimately, we think of transdisciplinary in terms of research, bringing together very disparate research groups. But it also applies to, career, to careers. If we are educating people in STEM, they go out with this great skill set I just described, and they can uh, contribute in so many ways uh, to many different kinds of careers and to many different, uh, uh, not just scientific breakthroughs, let's say. So good training is a part of creating this contribution to STEM. And so if STEM is more interesting, if it's more inclusive, that means that we'll be able to, to attract more students to this field. And we all know how important it is to keep the pipeline open and keep people bringing in. And I, I bring this, this uh, topic up because I think that uh, EDI is important to be able to attract more students uh, to our field. And for this, we can look at a few statistics. Uh, women make up 50% of the workforce, but are only 25% of the, the STEM. Uh, blacks, 11% of the workforce, but just 6% of STEM. Hispanics, 15%. Uh, this is from the, the US census, by the way. 15% uh, of the workforce for Hispanics and only 7% of STEM. So if STEM is important, it's important to access more of the available workforce. And so clearly, uh, I'd like to motivate you for uh, why uh, working uh, to bring more people into to STEM could be linked pretty closely to uh, EDI. I'll uh, just give a few statistics. Since I'm working in Canada, I had access to some statistics about women in, in engineering. And uh, I said that there was maybe 10% uh, women at Caltech when I was there, and it has gotten better. But if we look at the statistics for women in engineering, it really isn't that much better. There's still a lot of improvement that could go on. And in fact, if I'm an electrical engineer, and electrical engineering, the statistics are particularly poor. So 
there is room for improvement. There's still work to be done today to try and attract uh, a more diverse uh, body uh, to the um, uh, STEM disciplines. So there's equity and diversity, discrimination, inclusion. These are some words that you know, we've heard bantered about, but perhaps uh, do we really know what these terms refer to? And in particular, how does it relate to uh, our role as educators, as professors uh, in STEM? So equality versus equity, that sometimes can be uh, confusing, but this uh, um, graphic is, is great for getting the idea across very qu quickly. Equality gives everybody the same resources. Equity gives some more resources if needed in order to uh, make it everybody actually able to achieve uh, their goals. So equality does not mean equity. Uh, another way of looking at it is in the opportunities and how you go from beginning of your career to maybe being advanced in your career. And equality means everybody you know, is able to advance in their career, but equity realizes that uh, some people may encounter more obstacles to achieving success in their career goal. And you know that's something that uh, we should be concerned with. Um, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll quote from uh, one of the Canadian uh, judges who ruled on equality in, in employment and saying that it's not that individuals and dedicated groups are inherently unable to achieve equality on their own. No, no, it's much more that there are obstacles which can be so formidable that it's very difficult for them to achieve them, and that equality will not occur unless we make it happen. And so uh, this is why uh, equity uh, would be important to uh, integrate into our STEM uh, environment. So if we look in higher education, I'm going to talk about atmosphere in education and the impact it can have. And one way of looking at this, I found this at UCLA, which I found very um, interesting way of, of trying to understand the atmosphere in academia and the impact it can have. And it's looking at sort of two philosophies about intelligence. And in the upper one, we have what we call the incremental view of intelligence. And what we mean by this is we think of intelligence as something malleable, something that changes, uh, something that can change if we make an effort. The entity view is the other uh, perspective, which is that intelligence is somehow fixed. You either have it or you don't. Um, you have what it takes or you don't have what it takes. And if we have these two sort of philosophies, when we take these philosophies into the classroom, they can have uh, um, perhaps unexpected uh, impact. So if we look at how we want our students to be engaged in the learning process, how we want them to pay attention in class and be motivated and, and try to strive and succeed. And, and uh, you know, I teach a lot of hard classes and, and I want my people to succeed in these classes, even though they're difficult. They are difficult. We, uh, it takes a lot of work. I don't even, you know, some people might have easier times, but in any case, classroom engagement, very important for success. An entity approach, what do we mean by entity? It might be one that is quicker to judge. Uh, if, for instance, a very poor score on a first test might be a mindset that says, oh, this person doesn't have what it takes. Um, you're not heartless if you have an entity approach, you know, but you might give advice which is comforting, but maybe in the end not very helpful, just drop the class. Instead of like double down, work hard, your first exam didn't do it, you weren't, you weren't, you know, putting enough effort in or not using the right resources, whatever the reasons. Students quickly understand and you know, pick up on uh, different mindsets that a professor might take into the classroom about this entity versus um, incremental. And there are many ways that it could be broadcasted to the student. One is just in recruitment materials for the university. Are we stressing intelligence or are we stressing motivation? Um, and also when we uh, broadcast um, expectations. Only 20 cents percent of the class will get an A. Somewhat entity, you know, it's just you have to be up at the top in order to succeed. And uh, another one, which is this is a difficult class, but consistent effort leads to success. So a little bit more of an incremental. So, okay, we may have different philosophies on this, but my, imp my uh, point to make now is the impact 
of this atmosphere in academia that has on the students that we're training in STEM. And if we look at uh, polling of underrepresented or stigmatized groups, um, they find their impression is that entity organizers are less, tr they trust them less than they would an incremental organization. And if they encounter an entity organization, they expect to see stereotyping. And uh, they um, find that organizations are more likely to trigger their stereotype threat. What a stereotype threat means? It's a fear of confirming or being seen to confirm negative stereotypes about one's group. And you know, I live that. You don't actually personally represent half the world's population. Um, so uh, it depends on, uh, we can overcome that kind of uh, feeling in underrepresented groups by having uh, an uh, approach which is uh, less entity, uh, more incremental in the uh, philosophical approach. And finally, I'd like to point out that studies show that what you say to students about their ability to succeed can matter more than what they personally believe. And so we are having a, a tremendous impact on the students in STEM and that we should be uh, careful that our influence is very positive and helping them achieve the best that they can. Uh, stereotypes, of course, uh, can be integrated uh, very early. Uh, if you type how to draw a scientist in Google, Bing, uh, whichever uh, search engine you like, you're going to get something that looks a bit like this, uh, which may not uh, always reflect per per people's personal images. And if you uh, pictured, you know, ask somebody to draw a scientist or a leader, uh, they're going to come up with um, pictures that may not be uh, very inclusive. There are many uh, uh, examples I could give of implicit bias or unintentional bias or subconscious bias. And uh, if you want to pause this video and enter these search terms into Google Scholar, they'll come up with the uh, literature about it. I just want to give one example, uh, and that's uh, for reference letters. As a professor, I'm asked to write um, uh, reference letters for my students finding their first job, uh, students going on to graduate school. And there, has, there have been many studies showing that uh, there's a very different um, uh, type of letter written for females versus males, and I'm sure that crosses uh, occurs on many uh, other uh, groups as well, and that the reference letters are shorter, more vague, and less emphasis on research when written, written, written for women. So uh, I, this, this applies to women writing reference letters, men writing reference letters. That, that doesn't matter. It's just women also make these mistakes. And so I personally, when I write a letter of recommendation for one of my women students, I get out the um, little guide that says, check the uh, adjectives you're using, etc. It just sneaks in. It's just something that we don't want to uh, perpetrate uh, this problem. So I think of that as, you know, one of the things that we can all do about bias, and I, and I, I welcome you to also think a little personally about what we can do uh, about bias. And that might be in a peer review, uh, in academia, in writing of papers, conference evaluations, or in your uh, uh, organization, company, uh, what we can do. Recruitment also is important letter. I mentioned reference letters. So when we're involved, in these um, activities, if we can be careful uh, to try and identify our own uh, maybe unknown bias and uh, just be aware of it and discuss it. Uh, you can also try to be more inclusive by, uh, especially in the classroom, um, not always having every example being a, a man engineer, for example, or, or others. Uh, but I don't want to make this just about women. That, that, that's not very accurate either. Uh, it's just the examples that are always coming to my mind because of my bias. So uh, I, I want to bring really to the end here. The last um, uh, topic is inclusion. And I could talk to you about inclusion, but I would much rather refer you to a very entertaining and informative uh, video called Pearl, P-U-R-L, by Pixar. And I put the link at the bottom to YouTube 
but if you just type in the search terms on YouTube, Pearl and Pixar, you will come up with this eight minute uh, video, which really um, explains about what we can do in the workplace to make our workplace more inclusive. So I really encourage you to uh, uh, look at that video. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that EDI is important and it's especially appropriate in terms of our STEM goals to uh, training, uh, training students well in STEM and recruiting more uh, students into STEM. Uh, equity is a goal that we have set as a society and now in academia or in uh, photonics education, we should also be adopting this in ours. Um, bias can block our efforts to achieve equity and diversity. So I've cited some, some research if you're interested in it and there are some actions that you can take. And inclusion, as the uh, video will show you, can boost productivity, creativity, and retention. So if we train these students in STEM, we'd certainly like to see them continue to contribute in STEM. All of that now leaves me to my fourth lemma. Some of you were paying attention and realized that I promised four lemmas and only delivered three so far. And so the fourth lemma of the woman engineer is that your best work may have nothing to do with tech. And for me, that means it's the people uh, you grow with. And so, uh, you know, I've had uh, many uh, masters, PhD students, postdocs who've worked with me and a very diverse group. And we have had a lot of fun uh, working uh, together. In fact, uh, I was uh, uh, in whether in, when I was working in industry for a while or uh, when I tried to explain to my graduate students what baseball was. A lot of them coming from outside of the U.S. and having no idea what it was, and I'm a big Cubs fan. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, have a, a great conference.